This is our second session on Ephesians 5, 3 through 7. And I want to focus on the meaning of sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, or, as we saw, the parallel terms, sexually immoral one, impure one, covetous one, those correspond to each other and uh, ask what these are, and particularly why covetousness is included with two terms that probably have to do with sex, and why and becomes or here, and whether idolater is a key. So, Father, however sexually promiscuous any of us is or has been, however uh, covetousness any of us is or has been, we have much to learn here. That is, much to take heed to, be warned by, be purified by, be kept from by your Spirit because of Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us and purchased at the price of his blood our purity. So, come. Do the work that needs to be done, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So sexual immorality is a a term that focuses especially on fornication or the having of sex with a a prostitute. But then Paul uh, includes impurity here. Now, impurity uh, puts a dirtiness on the act of immorality. It's not just a a moral issue. It becomes a kind of shameful uncleanness. So that these two terms are linked several times in Paul. Just point them out. 2 Corinthians 12. I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity and sexual immorality and sensuality that they have practiced. So these are the two terms in Ephesians 5, and they're linked here as they are there. Or here again in Galatians 5.19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, there they are again, same two words, back to back. Or here again in Colossians chapter 3, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity. There they are again, back to back. So in Paul's mind, these two go hand in hand over and over again. And probably uh, impurity is added, especially when he says all impurity here. So not just an isolated sexual act, a one night stand, say, with a prostitute but rather everything associated with that kind of immorality. And you could think of things like uh, imaginations, fantasies, pornography, uh, planning strategies, entertainment that supports it, all kinds of things that cluster around sexual immorality, endorsing it, promoting it, condoning it, advancing it, making it seem more acceptable, Paul would include all of impurity in those things. Now, the question is, why covetousness? Because it seems like, I mean, most of us, this is the last of the Tenth Commandments, thou shalt not covet. And most of us don't think sex when we read that Tenth Commandment. We think, don't covet your neighbor's house, because that's what the text says when it's expanded. Don't covet their donkey <laughs> today, their car. Don't covet. And what, what is that? And this or here seems to suggest that this is another form of these. In other words, he's saying, Sexual immorality and impurity, 
Or you could say covetousness, meaning Paul's thinking this this um, heart of sinful desire is what's under these. And then you get down here, the immoral one, the impure one, which corresponds to those, or covetous one. And then he inserts, that is idolatry, or that is an idolater. It's as if Paul could overhear my question, right? Paul hears me read this and say, hmm, immorality, impurity, huh, covetous. Why would you include that, Paul? Bang! Because it's idolatry. Now, but what does that tell us about this or? Doesn't it tell us that when Paul thinks covetous, he thinks greed? And greed or desire, not just for money or for things, but a heart that is so desirous of other things, it reveals God is not the treasure. God is not satisfying. God is not king and inheritance in this person's heart. And therefore, their hearts are giving rise to all kinds of cravings, and these happen to be very prominent, namely sex cravings. I must have illicit sex. I can't restrict my sexual life to marriage where it is sanctified and pure and holy and beautiful. I must have the vulgar manifestations of sex, and I will do everything I can to keep this a live possibility for me, and therefore they're driven by desires, and those desires underneath these, hinted at by that or, are idolatrous desires. Which now explains one more thing. Does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. No inheritance, no kingdom. Why? Because an idolater expressing his idolatrous craving in immorality and impurity doesn't have Christ or God as the heart's inheritance, doesn't have Christ or God as the heart's king. So if you think, wow, why would a person who's immoral or impure or covetous go to hell? And the answer is because in heaven, that's where people go who so cherish Christ that he is their inheritance. Heaven is where you go to be with people who so treasure the king, God and Christ as their king. They have Christ as their king, God as their king, God and Christ as their inheritance. But the person who is craving with desires because Christ is not satisfying the heart, God is not satisfying the heart, I must have a prostitute, I must have pornography, I must have some form of dirty, illicit sex, and I must create a whole philosophy of life that says there is no such thing as impurity, and that it's hate speech to call somebody impure if they engage in extra heterosexual marriage for their own gratification. That's the way it is. So the big issue here is covetousness is under these. Covetousness is idolatry. Idolatry is the failure to have Christ and God as your inheritance and your king. And that's why people experience the wrath of God coming upon them.